G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. We really appreciate you joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. Canberra always was and always will be Aboriginal land and it's Ngunnawal country here and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and also extend a welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us on the webinar today. During the pandemic, the Australia Institute has been doing these webinars at least once a week, but like this week, sometimes there's two or more. So make sure that you're on our website to find out all the latest details. We've actually only got one webinar left this year after today. So check it out so you don't miss out at tai.org.au forward slash webinars. And just a few Zoom tips uh, before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panelists uh, and you can also upvote other people's questions and make comments on them as well. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. We've only had to do that once or twice this whole year. So not a huge problem, but please uh, keep things civil. Also, if you find the chat a bit distracting, just click on that button. It'll come up as a separate window and you can minimize it. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and we'll put it up on our website and our YouTube channel uh, later this afternoon in case you have to duck out for any reason. So we've already talked about Australia's uh, news media code this year with the chair of the ACCC, Rod Sims, earlier this year. But basically the problem that we're facing is that Australia's media industry is one of the most highly concentrated in the world. And like media across the globe, it's really been dealing with declining uh, revenue from traditional sources. And this decline in revenue is really impacting on the media's ability to produce uh, quality journalism, particularly investigative journalism. The pandemic has accelerated a lot of these problems and we've seen more than 157 newsrooms closed temporarily or for good and many local newspapers cease printing or going digital only since about 2019, um, early on. So the ACCC is Australia's competition regulator and in July this year, it published a draft news media bargaining code for consultation. The code seeks to address the fundamental bargaining power imbalance between Australian news media businesses and major digital platforms because that imbalance has resulted in the news media businesses accepting less favourable terms for the inclusion of news on digital platform services than they otherwise would have agreed to. And the ACCC has made the point that while bargaining power, uh, power imbalances exist in plenty of other areas, uh, when it comes to the imbalance between news media businesses and the major digital platforms, they're prioritizing this because a strong independent media landscape is so essential to a well-functioning democracy. We've seen a backlash. Uh, in August, Google began warning Australian consumers about the impact of the draft code by a, a yellow alert warning that you might have seen across all of its services, including search, news, and YouTube. And Facebook threatened to remove all news from its platform in Australia if the code went ahead in its current form which I think rather neatly illustrates the power and reach of Google and Facebook. So the government of Australia is now expected to introduce the draft legislation to parliament next week. The passage of the bill through the Senate is not assured, but the crossbench has made it clear that support for our public broadcasters, ABC and SBS and the AAP Newswire would be enough to secure its passage through the Senate. And of course, this uh, is not uh, any government's first attempt to regulate big tech, but others have tried and failed, particularly, uh, I think there's been some attempts in Europe that have not gone so well. So this is of global interest, uh, the results of this legislation. And to discuss the power of these tech giants, like Google and Facebook, how they're regulated and their impact on news media, we're delighted to introduce not one, but two distinguished international guests today. Professor Joseph Stiglitz is an American economist and professor and president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia. He's also co-chair of the High Level Expert Group on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress at the OECD and the Chief Economist of the Roosevelt Institute. He's a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, the John Bates Clark Medal and the Sydney Peace Prize here in Australia in 2018. 
He's a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and a former member and chairman of the US President's Council on, of Economic Advisors. And Anya Schifrin is the Director of Technology, Media and Communications at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. Before entering academia, Anya was a business journalist who, among other roles, worked for a number of newswire services, including Reuters. Anya's past roles and her current research focus provide her with a really unique perspective on Australian media debate, and that's why we're so excited to have her join us today. And lastly, they'll be in conversation with Richard Dennis, the Chief Economist and former Executive Director of the Australia Institute. Richard is a prominent economist, author and public policy commentator, a former associate professor in the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU here in Canberra. And he's also the author of several books, including Econobabble, Curing Affluenza and Dead Right, How Neoliberalism Ate Itself and What Comes Next. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today, Joe and Anya. We really appreciate it. Anya, I might come to you first. As someone coming from the media sector, um, what is the significance of what Australia is trying to do with uh, the regulation of Google and Facebook here and, um, and how important is it? Ebony, thank you so much. It's really uh, wonderful to see everybody. Good morning to all of you in Australia. It's nighttime here, of course. <laughs> and um, just seeing you both is reminding us of all the wonderful visits that we've had, both to the Institute and traveling around Australia in general. Um, I've had so many interesting conversations with friends at RMIT in Melbourne and universities in Sydney as well, as well as in Canberra. And it's always, um, inspiring because we're interested in so many of the same problems. And I always learn from how Australia is trying to solve some of these global problems. And in this case, really this problem about how to support journalism in the face of a huge onslaught of financial troubles. And as you mentioned, this huge um, economic imbalance with the big tech companies. Um, for the last few months, I've been working on a research project for the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, looking at what has happened to journalism around the world since the start of the COVID pandemic. And because I teach and I work with young people, I always feel that I need to focus on solutions so that they don't all sort of want to, you know, kill themselves after they've had a class. <laughs> Me. And when you study, <laughs> it's very easy to get depressed. So for the fall, we said to ourselves, let's really look at what people around the world are trying to do to help journalism. And very quickly, of course, we learned about this Australian initiative coming out of the Competition Authority. And in fact, many in the class watched the recordings of some of the events and the discussions that you've had. And one of my students, Kylie Tumiati, ended up writing a whole section of the report just about what Australia is doing. So I think that when we look, um, I mean, the basic problem is that COVID has accelerated trends that we've been seeing in journalism over, over years. We've seen a huge sort of financial shake out and collapse for many, many outlets and um, the demise of local news in many places. And what's happened since the COVID pandemic is around the world, media outlets are shutting down and journalists are being laid off. Um, Luminae Foundation said they thought that COVID could actually be an extinction event for many media outlets in Africa and even in countries like Bolivia. So it's really around the world, media outlets are collapsing, partly because the ad advertising revenue has uh, fallen so dramatically as economies have cratered all over the world. And so it's a very bad situation. And at the same time, consumption of news has skyrocketed because there's become even more of an understanding of the importance of quality information and how important that is for societies. So looking around the world, we said, okay, we know what the problem is, but who's doing something to fix it? And it became clear that, you know, Google and Facebook are giving lots of small grants, uh, lots of foundations are giving small grants, but I think there's an understanding now that that just won't be enough. We need huge structural shifts we need to get the tech companies to help pay for news, and that's going to require regu regulation. So I think that what Australia is trying to do is really capturing attention from around the world. I mean, we were very interested to see that, you know, it's even being followed in places like South Africa and in Botswana. 
and in Argentina, and certainly in Europe, where the European um, where the Digital Services Act is about to get to get uh, the new version is being released, I think next week. So I think that there's a huge hope that what Australia is doing will work, that it will support uh, quality information, and that maybe other countries will be able to copy it. So I think I think you're very brave to go out there on your own, um, but you're being you know you're being watched closely because everyone's fingers crossed, hoping this will really make a difference to support quality news and journalism. Um, Thank Joe, you so much. Let me ask you a question, Joe. As as economists, we we love um, you know we love innovation. We 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 love change. We, we we love competition. So you know these tech companies come along, Google and Facebook, and to some extent they've they've made so much information available to so many people easier than it's ever been. Uh, you, you won the Nobel Prize in economics, saying how important it is you know for people to have access to free information. So why aren't why aren't economists celebrating the rise and rise and rise of Google and Facebook? Don't, don't we just want free information out there as quick as we can? It is one thing we want, but we also like markets to work well. We want uh, competition. We want transparency. And unfortunately, one of the side effects of some aspects of innovation can be market power. It's always been a problem that uh, people who enter the market may have market power. But this is probably the worst we've ever had. Uh, and that's because there are uh, a couple characteristics of the new technologies that lead to a real concentration of market power. One of them is called network externalities, is that everybody wants to be on the same platform. Uh, you can't have a platform of one person, <laughs> and 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 uh, that the, the there are a few that succeed and they dominate the market. They become effectively monopolists, and markets don't work well when there's monopoly. Um, all the gains to innovation go to the monopolists, and in fact, they can use their market power to hurt to actually hurt others. And the second thing, for markets to work well, you need transparency. You know, we always talk about price transparency. Um, there is no transparency on the part of these digital giants. They can target messages to particular individuals. We don't know how the algorithms work. Uh, and uh, the way they function can have a life and death uh, effect on media, on businesses of all kinds. So uh, this is not a normal market. That's really the point. Yes, innovation is good, but what we hoped in the beginning, maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, we hoped they would self-regulate. I didn't believe that. I, <laughs> I watched this notion of self-regulation by banks. It's sort of an oxymoron. So I was not hopeful, but a lot of people have talked about it. Um, we now have seen the utter failure of self-regulation. And that means we have to go on to uh, what's next. And that's where what you're doing in Australia is so important. Uh, you're uh, one of the beginnings of the exploration of uh, what's next. Um, so, Anya, in Australia, we have this plucky little media company called News Corp. You've probably heard of it. And it's a little sort of startup thing. And underdog. It, yeah. Underdog, exactly. So it, it argues, and I, I think persuasively, it argues that despite owning 70% of the newspapers in Australia, it doesn't have the market power to take on Google and Facebook. Now, given that Australia's got one of the most concentrated, if not the most concentrated newspaper markets in, in the democratic world, if News Corp can't stand up against uh, Google and Facebook, how, how are smaller newspapers and media companies uh, faring in, in other countries? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think that, I mean, that was obviously a leading question, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sarcasm <really>. alert. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they have no hope of standing up against Google and Facebook. And that's why I think it's really interesting 
um, it, you know, there's so many good things about the code, but I think also the fact that it requires Google and Facebook to share more of the data to not change the, I think the recommendations uh, without warning media outlets. I think that's, that's incredibly important because we've seen around the world how Google and Facebook can really just decide overnight to where, how much traffic to send. To, to small outlets and how vulnerable they become. So um, I think you're absolutely right that smaller outlets need protection. You know, clearly there's some benefits too, right? Because they can get far more traffic from collaborating with these large sites, but that comes at a cost. Um, so I think it's I think it's really important what you're trying to do. And I, I know that in Australia, the fact that this law would benefit News Corp has been a, a real you know, subject of worry. And nobody wants to give Rupert Murdoch more money, obviously. Um, I say this as a New Yorker who, you know, <laughs> New York Post, and, you know, we won't, we won't rehearse the sort of Rupert Murdoch arguments over again. We all are very familiar with them. But um, I think that including the public broadcasters in Australia is obviously a, a very, very good idea. And um, I hope that that amendment will ha help the smooth the passage of the bill. I mean, what, what do you think? Do you think that will make a difference? Do you think there'll be more support? For the yeah, oh, look, it's interesting. Yeah. So in Australia, you know, we haven't kind of got to the politics of the bill yet. But yeah, the, in Australia, it's the government that's proposing this. And it's a it's a fascinating sort of parliamentary situation to watch because you have a, a, a conservative government putting forward a bill to regulate big companies and arguably, you know, rhetorically they're not into regulating, but, uh, and usually they'd be criticised for intervening in the market, but usually the people that would criticise them are News Corp. Um, and <laughs> News Corp are the ones that are going to benefit from the creation of, of this bargaining code. Uh, and at the same time, you have kind of the centre left and the left of the parliament really worried about media diversity, really worried about the smaller non-Murdoch papers that, you know, if, if Murdoch can't stand up for himself, the smaller independent newspapers uh, certainly can't. So you have this incredible political uh, moment where you've got a, a centre-right government, a centre-left opposition, uh, a left crossbench in the Senate, uh, all working hand in glove with, with News Corp to try and sort of push for this, uh, to try and push for this uh, new code. Uh, and, you know, Rod Sims, the competition regulator, who usually might express concerns about News Corp, you know, and their market dominance is, is, is similarly out there saying we need to do this. Uh, but, yeah, look, as, as you said, a lot of people are rightly uh, concerned, you know, if, if, if the Murdoch media companies are the beneficiaries of this, is, is it really a good idea? Uh, and one of the ways that that's been softened has been to say, well, this could be a new source of funding for the public broadcasters. Uh, and indeed, uh, there's, there's now support from the Senate crossbench for uh, public funding for the AAP Newswire service which is a kind of a wholesale provider of news that actually facilitates low cost news and, and new entrants into the market. So it's the strangest political alignment, you know, I've perhaps ever seen. Uh, Google and Facebook are obviously not that happy about it, but they, they seem to have united nearly everyone. Um, but let me just turn that comment in, into a question for you, Joe. I mean, You've obviously written a lot about inequality. Inequality often comes from market power or, you know, uh, one group bargaining with another group with far less power. Uh, can, can these kind of bargaining codes work? What does is, what is history and theory tell us about a government trying to tilt the playing field to make it easier for, for smaller players to negotiate with a bigger player? Well, first, let me say that, that the imbalance of, of market power bargaining power uh, is sort of reflected in, in how uh, revenues, uh, ad revenues are being divided now. And uh, uh, the, the uh, social media are getting an overwhelming uh, fraction uh, of those uh, just soaring. And uh, the newspapers are getting smaller and smaller uh, fraction. You know, media that are actually producing the news that are the, 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 that we all uh, depend on. 
uh, there was actually uh, in the Wall Street Journal today a very graphic picture uh, of how things have changed uh, so dramatically. Uh, the re let me just before getting answering your question uh, to emphasize why this is so important. Um, historically, uh, the production of news has been a joint product with advertising by uh, 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 in newspapers, and uh, so that those ads have supported the production of the news that we all depend on. And uh, it's, you know, economists have worried about this uh, uh, curious arrangement. Uh, there are arguments for public funding of the production of news, but most countries have, have chosen at least to have a significant reliance on this advertising driven model. But if advertising is going down, there won't be the production of news. And so in a way, it's very short-sighted of Google and Facebook and other social media. Um, they won't have any quality news to put on the social media because that's part of our worry. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't care. What the, they just want traffic and uh, traffic of hate speech or incitement. Uh, these are things that get people more engaged. Uh, and so... Uh, the impact on our society of having all this ad revenue go to the social media is absolutely devastating. So that's why uh, this is one of the reasons why this is so important. Now, uh, your way of trying to intervene in this real imbalance of bargaining power by having at the back uh, the threat of um, arbitration uh, seems to me a, a way of dealing with it because in the end, what you're saying is if you don't put up a good offer, this is going to a judge and the judge will look at these factors and the bill talks about some of the factors like the cost of production of the news and um, that uh, will, will um, I hope, incentivize the two parties to, uh, and in particularly the social media, Google and Facebook, to bargain in good faith. But as you know, they've threatened, uh, Facebook has threatened not to carry any news, uh, any local news. That itself is testimony to their market power. What kind of a platform would weaken the quality of what it does? Well, if you were in a competitive market, you wouldn't say, I'm not going to carry any news because your competitor would say, I'm going to carry news and make my platform more attractive. The fact is they have such market power, they can get away with that kind of threat. And I think you have to be aware that if they should choose to execute that threat, which is not inconceivable, you have to go to plan B, which is to actually... Uh, to impose a tax on the uh, media um, and use that tax directly to fund uh, the uh, social to, to fund the real news uh, production. Um, I might just pick up on that uh, and come back to you, Anya. Um, sure. It is a different approach using competition policy. I think other countries have used uh, mm -hmm. IP or copyright and, and those kinds of arguments. But really the driver behind this and, and why the ACCC has said that they're, they're focused uh, and, and prioritising this is because quality journalism is essential to a healthy functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. So recently we have seen the inclusion of um, our public broadcasters and potentially the AAP Newswire as part of this code. But can you just talk to me, I guess, given what's been happening through COVID about the importance of journalism and um, why it's important to include, for example, public broadcasters in, in this type of code. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've, I've been having a great time putting on my glasses and reading all the comments in the chat. <laughs> and I'm very impressed by how engaged your audience is. I wish you could all come and take my class because this is really, you know, this kind of conversation, I can see we could go for hours here, um, including some criticism as well. And yeah, one of the things I wanted to address is I was, 
I saw the um, articles in the paper where some some people in the parliament were talking about how they uh, didn't want to include the public broadcasters. And I know that, you know, around the world, I travel around the world and people love to bash their local public broadcaster. You know, they love to criticize the BBC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think that a quality public broadcaster is one of those things that you really don't appreciate it until it's gone. You know, it's a bit like the famous, they pay paradise and put up a parking lot. So the fact that you have a public broadcaster, even though to you all, it might, you know, to many of you, it may seem irritating or flawed in many ways is such a huge thing for your society. And I think it's clear that societies that have public broadcasters are often less polarized. They have a sort of shared basis of common knowledge and common facts. So I think that including your public broadcaster in this bill and making sure that they get funding out of it is, in, is incredibly important. And so I, I just want to encourage you all to sort of appreciate your public broadcasters, you know, as at more than maybe you do right now. Um, there were also some questions in the Q&A in the chat just about polarization and the role of Facebook and, and big tech. And I think clearly, um, the situation we're in the US now has made it clear how um, dangerous mis and disinformation has become to our political system. Um, as you know, we're just right now living a really through a really shocking political moment where many, many citizens, you know, who watch Fox, sorry to get back to, to Rupert Murdoch and see disinformation online actually think that Trump didn't win the elections or that you know, I'm sorry. Uh, what? Whatever. So you know what I mean. That Biden, won. <laughs> that Trump actually won. They think that COVID isn't serious. So I feel like we're living this absolute nightmare. You know, which as communication scholars for years, we've talked about the importance of having high quality, salient information that everybody has access to. That sort of a structure. You know, it's a bedrock and the foundation of a functioning society. And we're really learning in the U.S. what it means when you don't have that anymore. Um, so it's a you know it's a pretty terrifying moment. And I think we've also realized. Um, without a shadow of a doubt that Google and Facebook did not do nearly enough to stop the spread of mis and disinformation. You know, we're seeing now through COVID that when they want to make an effort, they can, and mm. they deliver for years. Um, and this sounds like maybe a very long winded way to get back to the code, but the point is when you have an absence of high quality information, um, you need to do something to solve that problem and you and funding using funds from these big tech companies to help pay for quality news and okay I see the points being made in the in the chat that you know news corp is not quality news but that is one of the ways you can deal with it especially in societies like ours where we can't actually just shut these companies down and censor them one of the things we have to do is provide quality information and that needs funding. So I think that's that's part of why this is important. And I saw my friend Courtney asking what I think of all the proposals to tax Google and Facebook. Um, clearly, I think that's a wonderful idea. In the US, there's been a few proposals put out, including taxing um, of micro-targeted ads, which Free Press is, has proposed. But I think everybody would love to see the tech companies actually pay taxes and Amazon mm -hmm. You know, another perfect example. I don't know if that's too far afield, but it's somewhat it's somewhat connected because they've managed to make amass all these billions, and then they give piddling small grants and to a few local outlets, and they think that's acceptable, which it's really not. Um, we'll go soon to questions from the audience, but Richard, did you have any last questions? Yeah, Joe, just one last question for you. You you, you alluded to it before, but uh, we've kind of got this coincidence or, or irony to some extent once upon a time as a society we funded the collection of information through advertising and then mm. google came along and with an entirely different product sort of found that well while the newspapers collect information you know search engines help us find information but as luck would have it, they struck on funding that through advertising as well. So we've got one market trying to collect information and we've got another market trying to help us find information. 
but they're both fighting over advertisers to, to fund their model. So in that environment, do you think there's a, a stronger role for direct public funding, whether it's for public broadcasters or for the sort of the actual uh, reporters on the ground collecting news in something like a wholesale newswire service? Like, is, is the solution here to kind of help cut the link between collecting information and advertising because we probably can't cut the link between advertising and search. Yeah, so, so um, information is a, what we call uh, te technically a public good. Uh, by that, I mean uh, the extra cost of an additional person using it is close to zero. And uh, the precept in economics is that markets work when you charge for the extra cost, the marginal cost. That model doesn't work for the production of information. And so this is the fundamental problem. So when you have information, that's why, you know, research is very much the similar, producing knowledge like uh, uh, COVID-19 and how to find, that, that's a, a, a public good because once you discover it, the marginal cost of using that information is very low. Um, so these are arguments for the public provision of the production of knowledge, production of information, and to a large extent, the dissemination of knowledge and information. So I guess I do think it, it is a, uh, uh, a, a public function. Um, we want also to be, have a diversity of views. So this is why this is a distinctive kind of thing. It's different from the production of steel or anything else. We want, uh, it's a public good, but we also want diversity. And so that's why uh, a model where you have a public broadcasting uh, company, you maybe have some production of uh, support of, of uh, newspapers, uh, public support of newspapers, um, but then you also have uh, some done just privately. That kind of mixed model is probably the one that most democracies will have to evolve towards. Thank you very much. We'll go to questions from the audience very shortly. Um, but I do just have uh, Peter Lewis on the line. He's the head of the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. Um, Pete, you've got some polling out today. And did you have a question for the panel? Oh, hi, everyone, and um, thanks for everyone for being here today. It's a really interesting debate, and to um, Richard's point, it is a remarkable moment in politics. So we've got significant public support um, for measures to regulate big tech and particularly around the payment of news. It's kind of in the high 50s supporting propositions in the low teens for opposing it. So we're in this moment where we've got multi-partisan support for a proposition, um, assuming, as we believe, that... ABC and SBS will be in the final code. We've got strong public support. And I guess my question is what happens, what's, what's gonna happen next? And let me just chart this out from what I can see happening. The legislation we put in next week and it will sit over the summer. Um, the two big platforms will do everything they can to water it down over the summer. They will continue to access their tremendous networks. You know, as we were saying before, Ebony, you know, we've took out an ad in an, a newspaper to make our case. They just pinged every user in Australia on Google and um, I think to an extent on Facebook. So, yeah, it, it kind of proves the point. So we're bringing... We'll call it a draw, Pete. We'll call yeah, it a draw. We're bringing different <laughs> weapons to the gunfight there. Um, so the risk is it gets watered down. And then if it does land and get through, there is a very real risk that um, Facebook will make good on their um, threat to um, stop carrying news on the Australian platform. And yes, that will open up um, opportunities for competitors, but I think it will also be incredibly disruptive and also undermining of the public discourse if people still use mm -hmm. Facebook as their internet. So I guess my question is broader, which is, the notion of social license and the big tech companies, which I feel has been starting to be questioned over um, recent years, particularly since Cambridge Analytica when it comes to Facebook, less so Google. 
Interesting need to note, you know, for instance, ethical investments have gone really well through the lockdown because an ethical investment portfolio is anchored with Alphabet and, um, and, and Facebook. So I guess my question to the economist is, can you see a world where the so are, are there other pressure points, given that we've got multipartisan political support, we've got widespread public support, what are the other levers that are there to both in Australia and globally, um, pressure these um, organisations to maintain a viable public square that does underpin democracy? So I think in the United States, one of the levers is the employees of these companies. They've been very active in trying to uh, encourage their company to be socially responsible. Uh, there are some prominent resignations from Facebook. Uh, so I think that is one lever, uh, but in the end, uh, you know, what one hopes is that uh, they don't want to go to the mat, they understand where our society is, and uh, as I said, the, uh, the plan B is, has to be a tax, and so if they are, if, if Facebook says we're our response is not to uh, carry news. And you say, well, we want people to have news. You're, 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 you're really impairing the quality of, of the mechanism that people have to interact. Then I would say, okay, uh, you have this monopoly. There's no easy way of getting rid of the monopoly. Uh, the alternative is we'll tax you as the alternative pretty good alternative. <laughs> Anya, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I just want to ask Joe, my colleague at Columbia, Alexis Wachowski, has written about net states and argued that these companies are now so big that they're really more powerful than governments, right? And they're doing security, they're doing defense, they're taking on all these sort of government roles. So it's almost a bit like with you know, the old argument about the banks, like too, you know, too big to regulate. Do you think they are too big to regulate at this point? Uh, they're on the verge of that. And when, when I say too big to regulate, mm -hmm. it's they have, may have too much political power, but I think they have mismanaged things so badly mm -hmm. uh, in their political manipulation, the misinformation associated with COVID-19, uh, the invasion of privacy, that there's so much anger that they've lost that political battle. You know, the, 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 their campaign contributions can't make up for, uh, uh, for, their, for their dollars, to think about it uh, another way. Uh, the, an alternative that I talked about, I threw out in my book, uh, People, Power, and Profits, where I, I was worried about this uh, a couple of years ago, I said, uh, if they are too big to uh, regulate and they exercise their market power in this brazen way, like not carrying local news, mm. the thing is to basically nationalize them mm. uh, or, or to put in this, to create a public alternative platform. Mm. Um, so uh, just like we have alternative public news, uh, it may be time to have an alternative public platform. I think the switch costs, I think that would be, I think a lot of people have thought about building a, a alternative to Facebook. And I think the idea that you can get people to use it when, so, when yeah, with the network effects, isn't that what it's called? The network yeah, effects? Yeah. yeah. I, I That's why you may have to net, just nationalize. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, can I, can I add there? So that, yeah, I, I agree with everything both of you just said, but in, in terms of your sort of challenge and, you know, I, I think that these net states are a real thing, but uh, I think they might have more influence than some governments, but I don't accept for a minute they have more power. Uh, and the problem is sort of neoliberalism has stripped away so much of the public's confidence in the power of the nation state that we kind of don't believe that it has the power to do these things, which is quite different from it doesn't have the power to do these things. So... Uh, you know, Australia, it's, you know, I'm very proud of Australia, the way we've got through this pandemic, in part because our nation state stepped up and intervened in ways that we would have thought politically unimaginable 12 months ago. 
But the public are kind of standing there with their jaws on the floor thinking, God, government actually worked. You know, it did something. It saw a big problem and it stepped in and it wasn't perfect and it wasn't flawless, but it worked. So, yeah, I, I agree with you that these, these companies are getting kind of too big to regulate in inverted commas, but the too big to regulate is as much a statement about the willingness of the public to kind of pick that fight as it is of the size of the company itself. That's right. These are political choices that societies mm. make. And we're yeah. certainly through in the U.S. what happens when a government decides not to do anything about a problem, right? Which was basically... Yeah. We're sorry. <laughs> um, I've got a question here from Linda Talberg, and I think it's for you, Anya. Um, what are the other options for funding news beyond advertising? Um, and they give an example here of not-for-profit models such as ProPublica, subscriptions mm -hmm. such as the New York Times and memberships such as The Guardian. Are we seeing these kind of new funding models uh, emerge? Could you just... Um, talk briefly to that. Sure, yeah, this is something I've written a lot about. Remember that the not-for-profits usually have a big foundation or a philanthropist behind them. So um, I believe it was the Sandlers who founded and founded ProPublica, which has been a huge success. Um, you have Omidyar Network, Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundation that are all putting something like 20 to $30 million a year into journalism. And then you also have lots of um, foreign aid budgets as well that go into supporting journalism in developing countries. So not-for-profit usually means that somebody somewhere is, is paying the costs. Um, so that's absolutely a viable model as long as you have philanthropy and foundations and that's grown in the past year, decade and is going to keep growing. Um, then you have lots of smaller outlets and actually larger ones too that have been experimenting with everything like, as you mentioned, membership and membership can come with perks. So it's not just a subscription. It's also maybe a chance to visit the newsroom or get a t-shirt or have some say in what's being reported and media outlets all over the world have made a huge effort to sort of try to reach into communities and, and audiences. The, the problem is I would say that many of and the smaller startups are, have figured out ways to make small amounts of money through doing events and memberships and all the things you talk about in fundraising. And I think that Australia is hosting the Global Investigative Journalism Network Conference um, next in, in 2021. And that will be a really good chance to meet a lot of these sort of brave investigative journalists from around the world, many of whom run really small, you know, pretty small but influential outlets. I think the problem is that it's very hard to make a go and hard to last. And um, a lot of these outlets are, you know, pretty hand to mouth. It's hard to scale. So I do come back to the, uh, this argument that we do need, also need larger things like public service broadcasters and large institutions like The Guardian and The New York Times. I think, yeah, the small the small outlets are doing a good job, but on their own, it's not really enough to meet the information needs of complicated societies that require sort of very professional and experienced journalists who are able to devote large amounts of time to doing, you know, long investigative reporting. And it's harder for the smaller outlets to do that without, without a good funding base. Yeah, we've just had a really uh, important example of that here in Australia with the release of a, a huge war crimes report um, mm -hmm for our troops uh, in Afghanistan. And part of that was, you know, a whistleblower um, going to our public broadcaster, but also um, whistleblowers going to other media outlets as well. Um, so certainly, yeah, a, a really huge and important role there. Um, the next question I've got is from Leon Zembekis uh, or Zembekis. Um, I hope I've pronounced that correctly at least once there, Leon. My apologies. In the past, US governments broke up powerful companies like Bell Communications in the interest of public good. Joe, can you comment um, on some other contemporary companies that might need to be broken up for the public good? How good is competition working globally at the moment where we are seeing, you know, uh, much more uh, monopoly companies like uh, Google and Facebook emerging? Yeah. So in many, many sectors, uh, that is a good solution. But in this area, it turns out to be very difficult. 
Uh, the reason it's so difficult is the thing we kept emphasizing that everybody wants to be on the same platform. And so there will be a dominant uh, or one or two or three dominant platforms. That doesn't mean, I, th I think we should have taken uh, preemptive measures not to allow Facebook to buy Instagram. That was a mistake. And some people think at this point, you could actually force Facebook to divest itself of Instagram. So there are a few cases like that where you could uh, break it up. You could make sure that Google didn't, uh, what we call vertically integrate, didn't go into uh, uh, becoming a, a shopping mall, that it stay focused on a few things that are its core mission and doesn't use, uh, uh, doesn't go into other areas where it could lever the information that it gets as part of its search engine. So there are lots of things that competition authorities uh, can do. Uh, European Commission has, has brought cases against uh, uh, the companies for uh, anti-competitive practices. That's really important. But breakup is, uh, is not going to solve the problem, unfortunately, because of the dominance of the platform. One more problem, just to mention very briefly, um, that is actually, if you're trying to regulate certain things like hate speech, it may be easier, it may be, if there are, uh, are only a few platforms. So there's a worry. The, the point is that if we had been on top of things, we might have been able to do something about Facebook and the Rohingya and the way that they spread uh, uh, information that led to that terrible uh, um, genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it were a local platform, be very much more difficult to do something. We didn't do anything about it. So, uh, but at least there was the idea that we could have done something about it uh, if we had had the resolve. Um, we've talked a little bit and touched on the idea that uh, there has been this weird kind of uh, funding model for journalism based around classified advertising, particularly in print. Um, I've got a couple of people asking, but this one in particular from Prue Clark, and if both of you could answer, that would be great. What is your response to the criticism that this move is merely protecting a failed business model and taxing innovation? I love that. Hi, Prue. That's really nice. Yeah, so this is a standard complaint um, that comes up often, for example, in France, where they subsidize uh, newspapers and newsletters, magazines as well. That's a, that's a standard point that, that people make that it's protecting um, a failed business model. I guess until we find an alternative, um, I don't see anything. And I also don't think there's anything wrong with subsidizing a failed business model, right? <laughs> <laughs> universities, look at public television, look at all, <laughs> so many of the important things in this world don't actually make any money. And if we're, we have rich societies that can afford to fund those things, then I absolutely think we should. Uh, if you start going down the path of everything has to make a profit, well, then you end up in a healthcare system like we have in the United States. So I don't think there's any problem with um, funding a failed business model. I think what's important to do is what many countries that fund journalism do, which is make sure that it's in the public interest, make sure that it's adding to society, make sure that it's that it's useful. Uh, but you know, requiring things to make money necessary, I don't think I don't see why that's most important. And let me let, let the economist answer. Well, economist me, a different view. So the perspective is what I said earlier. There is no efficient business model for something where there's marginal cost is zero. Mm -hmm or close to zero and is a public good. Uh, you know, uh, if we relied on uh, the market for the production of basic research, we would not have discovered DNA. We wouldn't be able to respond to COVID-19. So, you know, many parts of our society, we realize are basically these kinds of public goods that have to be publicly provided. And we've gotten away with not providing it publicly by this curious marriage of advertising and the production of news. 
and it worked for a long time. And so we didn't have to face as much the uh, challenge of pu public uh, uh, finance. Uh, but it may be that we are coming to the time where we actually have to face the reality that like the production of basic research, uh, the production of good information uh, is an essential thing for a well-functioning democracy and we're gonna have to pay for it. Ebony, can I just put another option on the table? Um, sure. uh, one of the things that's come out in this debate has become in Australia, the, the, the role of a newswire. And a newswire is kind of like a wholesale producer of news. So uh, we talk a lot about, you know, discovering DNA as a public good. And we talk about investigative journalism as a public good. But for 100 newspapers in Australia to all send a journalist to cover one court case, is, is, is economically absurd. For a hundred small newspapers to send a journalist to one press conference is absurd. So uh, one way to help subsidize the failed business model, and, and yeah, I, love, I love your statement, like what's wrong with subsidizing a failed business model? I agree, if it's a good, if we, if we like the end result, of course we should subsidize it. But one way of subsidizing all of the media and not just the, the newsprint media is to subsidize the wholesale collection of news in the form of a news wire, subsidize the journalist that sits in court all day long, and then makes that story available to any newspaper that wants to take it. So mm. I, I guess my question to both of you is, uh, do you think that supporting a news wire service is a good way to support media diversity, as opposed to supporting just the failed business model, if you want to put it that way. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, but I would like, uh, if you're going to do go that route, uh, I would want to support more than one uh, wire service because it's not only you want diversity in the interpretation of the news, you want diversity in the collection of the news. So uh, um, I, I think it's important uh, there to have at least two wire services. Um, I was going to ask... Actually, I think presidents usually just have one, right? Each country usually just has one yeah. that they supported. Sorry, go on. No, that's all right. Um, I was just going to, before we uh, uh, wrap up, um, there have been some criticisms of the code, not just from Google and Facebook, but from perhaps some of the newer, smaller entrants, people that aren't as big as, um, say, The Guardian or others that have entered the market and, and done really well. But, you know, a lot of the small community groups wondering um, how they can be benefiting from this. Is that a risk that we should be looking at, um, that this code, you know, um, has the potential for some other effects that might impact, for example, smaller operators? Anya, do you want to take that one or Joe? Well, I was going to say, I don't really know enough about the local news markets in Australia. Um, I understand that the code is applying, I think, to outlets. Is it with more than 150,000 circulation? Is that right? Did I see that somewhere? Uh, revenue. Oh, revenue. Okay. What I, what I was going to say is I imagine that if you want to revise it later, I mean, again, I'm really on thin ice, but lots of countries around the world have found ways to channel funds to smaller local outlets. So I would imagine if you wanted to do that, you could, but I am not an Australian lawmaker, so I don't actually know whether that's feasible. Well, I was just going to add the, the almost obvious point that mm. uh, when you are going into new territory, uh, there's a lot to, lots to learn and you're dealing with these media giants. Uh, we don't know how they're going to respond in their bargaining. Uh, we don't know whether they'll be soft on some companies or hard on others. Uh, we so I think uh, one has to admit that you are going to have to review this after a year or after two years, look comprehensively at uh, how it is affecting each tranche of your media and uh, then ask, you know, do you go back to the drawing board? What do you change? So uh, that's, the, that's the nature of inevitable 
technology is changing, our laws have to change, and we have to learn uh, as both technology change and our laws change how to do things better. Yeah, um, and countries that have regulated the tech companies are going back and looking at the laws again. So Germany uh, and the SDG would be an example. Sorry. Yeah, and I think we spoke to the ACCC chair, Rod Sims, earlier this year, uh, and he made the point this is a draft code, you know, we need consultation and feedback on it. And I guess there'll be a second opportunity for that once the legislation uh, hits the Senate, it'll probably be referred off to committee as, as Richard said, and those organisations um, will hopefully be making submissions through that uh, process. But one last thing I just wanted to kind of end on um, is just back to the power of the big tech companies and coming back to, you know, that threat from Facebook to just kind of withdraw uh, all together. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, to, to wrap us up, uh, all of the panelists, do you think it's, it's worth calling the, the bluff here? Uh, I think it is, uh, as long as you're willing to uh, go the next step, if they, if they actually behave in another irresponsible way, the answer is uh, go to a tax. One of the things you have to remember, you know, is how- Although people in the chat are pointing out it should be either or, they should be paying taxes anyway, right? <laughs> but this is a different way if you can't collect revenue mm -hmm. for their use of news right. out of a bargaining process, this is another way of getting there. It's mm -hmm. not that this is the only basis of tax, but there are other right. taxes. But you know the the bad behavior of, of Facebook is is really quite uh, incredible. Um, when people signed up for Facebook originally, they signed and the and the platform was getting people on the platform and they were establishing their platform monopoly. They promised promised people uh, privacy. They wouldn't use the data for other purposes. And then of course, uh, as they became established as the dominant uh, uh, platform, uh, they violated that. Uh, not only did they promise it originally, they say they would never do these things. And of course they, they then went ahead and, and did it. So um, the, the, they behaved in a way that somebody with market power you might ex who doesn't have a sense of social responsibility might behave. and. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will change and you don't have to, to do these stronger measures, but it may be that you will have to. Anya, you've uh, seen various countries attempt something similar. What's your uh, pers perspective on the risks here? Um, obviously there's a risk, but I think it's a noble um, attempt. And if I were Australia, I would be trying to get other countries to, to follow suit actually, yeah. And Richard, finally to you. Look, absolutely. I said before, we, we need our nation states to be confident and part of confidence is actually meaning it when you, you know, not just bluffing, we, we should do this because it's the right thing to do. Uh, I think we have more bargaining power than we realize. Imagine if, for example, Facebook or Google kind of exit the market in the way they th uh, threat, then they're kind of showing the world. Like Australia is not a small country. Mm -hmm. We're 13th biggest economy in the world. If, if our sky doesn't collapse, if the world keeps turning here in our country after they exit, uh, these companies lose their threat in every other country around the world. Mm -hmm. So it is not costless for Google or Facebook to carry out these threats because when the sky doesn't fall in Australia, there might be some inconvenience or some change and some disruption. But when the sky doesn't fall, their ability to make that threat elsewhere evaporates. And as Joe said, there's, there's a myriad of other things we can do. I mean, we could impose a, a tax specifically on every ad purchased on Facebook and Google. It's not a tax on their profit, just a tax on the ad. Like we could do that tomorrow. We need as a nation state to feel confident to say, we want the world to look like this. Uh, and just, you know, again, let's see, this is a problem of imagination as much as power. Once upon a time, you couldn't change mobile phones because you had to tell everyone your new phone number. So no one switched. So the nation state stepped in and said, no, you have to allow people to take their, uh, you, you have to allow them to take their phone number when they switch. 
we could step in and force Facebook to do any number of things. And certainly the US could. So to think we're powerless in this is, again, it's a, it's a lack of imagination, not a lack of constitutional power. Yeah, and certainly in Australia, I think the, the pandemic, as you said earlier, has proven uh, just how much the government or the state can accomplish, or the state mm -hmm. governments, in fact, uh, when they put their minds to it. We are mm -hmm. going to have to wrap it up there. We've had about 750 to 800 people on this webinar with us from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anya Thank and you. Joe, uh, for your time and joining us all the way from the United States. And thanks to you as well, Richard. Um, and thank you everyone for your great questions. I'm sorry, there's never enough time to get through all of them. And, uh, and there's a lot to tackle in a complex subject like this, but we do appreciate you coming. There will be a recording that you can watch up on our website later. That polling that Peter Lewis talked about that the Center for Responsible Technology put out today, that's on our website too at tai.org.au. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And lastly, uh, we've got one more webinar left over uh, or remaining um, uh, to finish out this year. That'll be next week, Wednesday at 10 o'clock. That's with the ABC 730's Chief Political Correspondent, Laura Tingle, and she'll be talking about her quarterly essay on what Australia can learn from New Zealand. Uh, a hell of a lot, it turns out. It'll be really great. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh, stay one and a half metres away, wear a mask, keep washing those hands and stay safe out there, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks again. Thank you very thanks. much. Thanks, thanks Joe. Thanks, great Anya. Great Bye. Thank you. Bye.